I was a competitor. I was not a champion. I didn't have the physical, I mean, I was a full-time dojo rat, you know, in those days. What's happening, everyone? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 730. My guest today is Sensei Brett Mayfield. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of traditional martial artists and the traditional martial arts, probably you and the people that you care about and the place and the things that you love. And if you want to see all the things that we're doing to support you and yours and your training, go to whistlekick.com. That's where we have everything that we're working on, or at least a link to it, because we were involved in a lot of projects. One of the things that we're working on is making stuff. Yeah, we have a store. It's one of the ways that we cover the bills here. And if you find something in the store, whether it's maybe protective equipment or a fun shirt or a training program that you want to pick up, you can use the code PODCAST15. It's going to save you 15% on anything in there. Martial Arts Radio gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Pretty easy to remember, right? We bring you the show twice a week, always new episodes. And the goal of the show and really of Whistlekick overall is to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world. If you want to support the work that we do, there are lots of ways that you can do that. You can make a purchase, like I already mentioned. You could maybe tell a friend about us because, believe it or not, seven years in, everyone doesn't know about us, and we'd love to change that. But we also have a Patreon. If you want to go deeper on the things that we do, if you want to see the behind the scenes, if you want to know who's coming up as a guest, and so much more, patreon.com slash whistlekick. You can get in with as little as $2 a month, and there are opportunities above that where we give back even more stuff. And if you want the full list of all the ways you can help, as well as a continually shifting mix of behind the scenes and fun content, go to whistlekick.com slash family. It's a page that we set up for the people who love what we do most. There's no button for it. You got to type it in. But I get to see the analytics and I know that people come back to it. So we're doing something right. I've spent some time thinking about this episode. Sensei Mayfield was a great guest. I had a wonderful conversation that comes through quite easily. I'm sure you're all going to see that quickly. But there's something more here. There's, there's another quality that I guess the best word I can use is selflessness. And we'll talk more about that in the outro because what I see here is someone who gave everything that they had to the martial arts and got a lot back. And it's something that resonates for me and, and something I relate to. So here we go. Hello. Good morning. How are you? Good. Tired. Tired. We just started the day. Well, yeah. I didn't, but. <laughs> I, uh, I'd been spending the last week at the USA Special Olympic Games at, uh, oh. in Florida. and It was exhausting. I, I believe that. Sounds like an intense experience. Was, were you there in a martial arts capacity? No, no, oh, okay. I, uh, I'm, I was the Vermont delegations golf coach. Um, oh, nice. So, uh, but uh, they had 3,500 athletes uh, wow. and about five, it, and then with the support staffs and coach, about yeah. 5,500, 6,000 people. It was, it was wow. like, I mean, it was just like, I'd been to world games before and it, this was the biggest Disney was the host. So you can imagine yeah. it was huge, just giant. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. Nice. That's exhausting. I, I believe it. How long have you been doing that? Oh, my gosh. I've been in uh, with Special Olympics for, well, I started in New Mexico. I was a, a ski racing coach, <clears throat> and I started the first ski racing uh, special program way back in New Mexico. And then I came out to Vermont, and uh, one of my daughters has special needs, and mm. uh, and she actually, so she got involved when she was seven. So it, she's 30 now. So it, it's been a long time. So I've been coaching mainly skiing, golf, things like that. We tried a martial art program, it, the, a, uh, Special Olympic, and it just, I think, you know, there were some great competitors, great sure. competitors, but um, I'm not sure why the US, a just never grabbed hold of it and uh, I think there's some small local programs, but, but my daughter's, um, 
she teaches the my one of my junior classes mm. in karate now. So she's she's fully involved. It, it's been really interesting over the years. You know, I, I've kind of had two blocks of time where I attended a lot of martial arts competitions. You know, one in the '90s as a teenager, and then more now professionally with with Whistlepick. And in the '90s, I remember the special needs divisions being maybe not huge, but they had participation and solid participation. And now it's quite often, you know, because sometimes I'm in a chair and I'll see a sheet come through and it's special needs and it's nobody. Yeah. And in fact, most of the time it's nobody. I, I don't know if inclusion has been part of that. I'm not mm. sure. I am, I am for and against in, because nobody's inclusive. I mean, look at the right. martial arts. My right, God. Right, right. <laughs> no. um, so people like to be with kinds of people they like, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think inclusion probably has a little bit to do with it. Mm. You'd probably find a lot of kids on this or, and adults on the spectrum that are participating just in regular divisions, yeah. you know. Um, you know, and Special Olympics in itself, I mean, we play the golfers at this games played on the, at the Orange County uh, Golf Center, which is the second hardest course in the world. I mean, the U.S. And it's where the qualifications uh, are for the corn ferry. So you can imagine how hard these courses were. Yeah. And, way, and I felt, I mean, a lot of us complained, but um, the golfers, um, you know, everybody in Special Olympics, and it, it goes from the bottom line up to competitors that uh, are in college on teams. So, yeah. you know, it, it it's not, I think that's part of why we don't see it as much and it mm. didn't catch on is because it was mainly kids with Down syndrome and things like, you know, and and maybe that wasn't uh, inclusive enough. Interesting. But um, anyway, it, it was a great event. and uh, And I know, I mean, you know, half of my kids' classes nowadays have <laughs> the kids have gone. <laughs> they're somewhere out there, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I think a lot of it is inclusion. We just we just don't see it as much, uh, you know, out there. That's probably probably a, a good thing. It is. I think it is a good thing, but um, there are like all of us. We have limitations, sure. and I think divisions probably help with that. You know, you compete, but, you know, if you're in, you know, if you're at a tournament with, you know, a hundred, you know, kids, uh, you know, 12, 10 to 12, you know, those kids who probably have some kind of, you know, moderate uh, special need are not, you know, they're not going to go anywhere. I mean, that that's, I think that's something we, for, you know, we forget and, you know, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not against tournaments. I'm one of the, you know, we'll talk about that, but, um, and, and, you know, I'm not against them at all. I think it is a, a fun activity. I, I really do. It's exciting. It's fun. Uh, is it, is it judo? Is it karate? Is it, you know, probably not. Um, you know, I mean, even, even the Japanese look at kendo. I mean, kendo is a little different because you're, you know, it's an old, it's, it's, mm. you know, it, it's a little bit Koru uh, when it started, you know, it started in the Tokugawa period. So, you know, it, it has that Koru effect to it. And, and, but I've even seen in Kendo, um, you know, the power and technique is not what it used to be. Sure. I mean, simple, I mean, and that's because if it was, people wouldn't come out. Right. let's be honest right. you know if we uh if we you know I, everybody debates you know back in the day of you know bill wallace and, and joe lewis and you know and i remember competing in the the 70s and i mean you just you know you hit people when it's funny you hit them you know and then man they were your best friend afterwards right. you know 90 percent of the time uh, or night more than 90, 90, but now, you know, it's, it's all for that. It's for the pride a lot. And, uh, yeah. it's, you know, I think Okinawa, intent matters. Yeah. In, yeah. Intent matters. If, if you and yeah. I are working together, a competition, non-competition, and we're challenging each other, each other, you know, we're embodying iron sharpens iron and I punch you in the face. 
and I leave a bruise. If I'm smiling while I do it and not in like a malicious way, we're good. Yep. But you, but I could do the same technique with half the power with an intent to harm you. And we're not going to be buddies after. Yep. You know, I, I'm getting ready in July to go to Okinawa. They're having their second adult international tur- world tournament and oh, the cool. first uh, children's uh, Okinawa karate tournament. Awesome. And um, they're trying to to and it's only kata no kumite oh, at all okay. no kumite um and i think that's not because there aren't some great you know one of the okinawans was on you know the J- japan olympic team uh, sure. well i think that was a kata practitioner but they're good fighters there's yeah. no doubt about that but i think it's more um you know they're trying to save the art part of mm-hmm. it you know um, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's interesting. I, you know, I, uh, I'm all for, cha- you know, we're not stuck and never would be stuck in, in, you know, the past of 200 years or 500 years or, you know, that's silliness. Um, but then, you know, I think, you know, and we'll, as we discuss, I, I teach martial arts as a lifestyle, whether it be to a six year old or a 60 year old or an 80 year old. I teach it as a lifestyle for them to enhance something in their life. Now, tournaments can be part of that. Obviously, fun is fun. Um, but um, yeah, that's, you know, it, it, it is interesting. And, and um, I, you know, I mainly myself competed in the 70s and then in Japan in the 80s. Mm. And then in the 90s, I pretty much you know i i I, some of my my adults and kids would compete um uh, but uh, well shouldn't say i'm sorry through the 2000s because i was big in au i i I put on the au nationals i uh was one of the um directors for the au junior olympic games years ago so au i you know uh i have to say that was my through my 90s up to you know, 2000, um, 2002, 2005, somewhere in there. And then after that, I, I was done, uh, you know, and I'm just starting, like I said, I'm taking an Indian team to, um, to Okinawa. My, oh, okay. Because I, cool. I teach here in America and, mm-hmm. and I have a huge program in India. And, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that on a but pure japanese level we go to no indian tournaments um you know because it's in india 90 percent of all martial arts is is sport sure um and and it's changing so it was 98 now it's about 90 in the last Ooh. five years because more people are getting the more indians are getting the opportunity to go to to travel around mm-hmm. the world and more people are visiting India uh, from Japan, America, Europe, and and that's enhancing the quality. Uh, you know, so uh, the sport is a little. It's still okay. huge. It's still sure. the number one thing, but it's a little less. But it, it's showing them that there's another another it's reason, showing. another way, another right. uh, lens onto what it is we practice. Now, now yep. here's a question, because. When you talked to, very briefly about your own time in competition, um, I, I don't want to say it was dismissive. It wasn't dismissive, but it seemed very much, yeah, this is a thing. I did it. It was fun. You know, uh, I, I didn't get the sense that it was an all-encompassing element of your life at that time. And yet the way we started our conversation and the entire thread thus far has been you dedicating time to supporting others in competition. Um, over the years, yes. But if you look, okay, so a good example would be when I was competing uh, USKA uh, back in back in the day, um, because that was the major that was the major circuit. Um, uh, you know, I I was a competitor. I was not a champion. Uh, I didn't have the physical. I mean, I. 
I was a full time dojo rat, you know, yeah. in those days. And, and, and most people were, to be honest, mm-hmm. most that trained, you know, we trained five to, you know, seven days a week, depending. But um, uh, I grew up in a what I would sense a more lifestyle from the very beginning. Now, I did start in judo, uh, but even then, as it, it was a kid and it was about fun, it wasn't about competing so much. Um, and I started in Sam Allery's program in, you know, in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. How, how did that happen? Because, you know, kids training back then wasn't common. No, Sam was amazing. You know, I, Sam Allery was the weatherman <laughs> for okay. the local. TV okay. station. And he was a big, big, you know, in those days, weathermen. And yeah, they were career. celebrities. They were celebrities. And he went to all the elementary schools as a weatherman. But he was also somewhat promoting his his judo program. Uh, now, Sam had also been training in Kaju Kimbo under, I forget who directly. I know he trained with Imperato, but Imperato was not his mm. primary teacher. But Sam was in that group. Um, and that's where he made his life afterwards. But at that time, he was the secretary of the United States Judo Federation, which was the, you know, military judo federation mm. uh, before uh, U.S. Uh, U.S. Uh, judo Federation, uh, USJA. Um, and so he had one of his, you know, some of his instructors had started a little program at the local YMCA where up and where I lived lived in Albuquerque. And so I, I met him in this school. I heard about it. He was at the YMCA where I was going to swim and stuff. And I saw those guys and those kids looked like they were having a lot of fun. And that was, a you know, and my, I, you know, my parents tell me and stuff. Now I grew up, my, my family, my father, my uncles were uh, Air Force people and they had trained in judo and they had actually, you know, so I had had some exposure but believe it or not, they when they got out of the military or even uh, judo didn't become a lifestyle. It was part of uh, that pre World War II stuff that they mm-hmm. had picked up uh, because of uh, because of what Japan was doing. You know, the Air Force was really one of our the primary ways to bring back uh, Japanese martial arts. I mean, we got to be honest here. So. Uh, it was not the Japanese who brought back Japanese martial arts. It was the foreigners who brought mm-hmm. back Japanese martial arts. So, um, so Sam had a really, you know, that's, it was his forte uh, in the beginning. You know, he was pretty high up on the line in judo. I don't know his, you know, I have no idea of Sam's rank. And rank wasn't talked about a whole lot in those days. If you were a Sondon man, you were big time, you know. Um, so. I did it. That's how I got into it. You know, he came to school. He was a celebrity. I had a great personality. Uh, Sam's still alive. He lives down in Mexico. Has I don't think he teaches actually, but I know there's, you know, he's there are Kaju Kimbo programs in Mexico that he, you know, he's lived there for years and um, that he started. So um, he's got, he's, since Allery, it's got to be in his late 80s early night. I mean, he's, he's up there, but he's still alive. I, I check in on the website occasionally just to see how, you know, where he's at, but I know he's, he's up there, but, um, that's how I got in as a kid. And I was lucky because I moved from Albuquerque to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And there in the mid sixties and, um, there was the Santa Fe Karate Dojo, though, and it was two young men. You know, I thought they, they were they were only a few years older than me, but you know, and two young men who, um, and one was a judo person. In fact, he was a Rocky Mountain judo champion at mm-hmm. one point. Uh, J. Michael Moore, who became my first mentor in martial arts. I mean, real mentor. Sure. And the other was Ernie Kelsey, and he was a Tung Soo Do under Kai Wong Kim. Um, so, um, and, uh, since a more had, he, he was from Denver, which was a, a, a very hot base for martial arts mm. during that time period out West. I've heard he that. had a lot of big, 
you know, a lot of big uh, ex-military and other people living up there who opened schools up. So um, he he had left his teacher um, semi falling out um, uh, and uh, he had joined the session Kai because they had been doing some sheet to row. It was a mix. You know, in those days, teachers were picking up whatever, whoever came along the road that they met. And his teacher had been studying Hakuru Jiu-Jitsu with Roko Yama, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Kaju Kimbo with um, uh, Imperado. And he, uh, his teacher was Robert Repu. I won't go into Robert's background at all, uh, but he's, you can find him very easily. <laughs> but he was a big time martial artist. Uh, and he brought Al Dukoskis uh, oh, over to okay. Denver. That's who brought Al to, to Denver. They had a, a falling out fairly quickly after Al arrived. And um, so, and he was doing Shintoru uh, under uh, Kuniba Sensei in the session Kai. Mm-hmm. So when I came in, I was, had start, I, you know, I, I saw judo on the window. So that was. So how old were you? By that time, During that six, seven, eight, uh, about let's see so six seven eight nine ten i was about 13 for you know i moved from albuquerque to my family i grew up on a ranch family and so we had moved to our home up in santa fe on the ranch and uh so i was a early teen preteen early teen and um and i i dr moore was probably early 20 was his early 20s you know but again you know it's, you know, it, it seemed much older as kids are always looking in. Yeah. So, um, he, and he had come from a pretty traditional background and even though he had competed in karate and judo at high levels, it was still a lifestyle. He had already by that time made it his life, mm. you know, early, early twenties, he'd already made it his life. Uh, which influenced me the rest of my life, you know, those kind of people. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and, and that's, you know, sort of where the road began. And uh, I got great exposure to Japanese martial arts um, mm-hmm. early. And, you know, I, 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 you know, I can remember, oh, I can definitely remember, I mean, training with Rokoyama when he had his American tour, mm-hmm. you know, came through and we all went uh kuniba sensei who i trained with for a while and became a, a friend and i'm friend with his you know, facebook friends sort of with his son over the last few you know quite a few years um and and a lot of the people who were bigger in session kai uh shitoru um and i you know and then we we hooked up with robert treas uh mm-hmm. in the 60s and um you know would go over to Phoenix uh, to train and uh, uh, with USKA and then got in, like you said, a little bit to USK circuit, you know, uh, main, my thing was mainly West. I, I, it, it was a little bit later before I started going to, um, you know, Florida and, you know, the other places they'd have mm. the grand nationals and stuff. Uh, Chicago, I, you know, different, I can't even remember all the, the different places, but, but I went as a, Comp- competing was just a, a sort of a fun break mm. in the daily training. It wasn't the daily training. It was a fun break in the training. And I just kept that in my mind the rest of my life, that it was a fun thing to do. Test your skills in a with rules and things mm. like that. Um, and so, I, you know, I've always found it a part you know, sp- sport karate, a part of the general lifestyle of, of, of martial arts. Mm. And as you know, and we're talking a lot of karate, but you're probably hearing, I don't consider myself a karateka. I, you know, in the, I probably, I mean, in the last few years, I've definitely said I, I'm a budoka. I, I, mm. I was lucky. People always say, oh, you know, you need to stay in one art. I, I'm not going to have that debate. Uh, I've never seen anybody in my peer or larger group that was in that category. And I'm not going to debate 
about it. We're, now, we're, on the, we're on the same page. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, you could pick anywhere from Kanizawa, who was, you know, one of the most technical Shotokan people and, you know, that came along. But he loved Tai Chi and he did judo and he practiced getting, you know, I mean, you know, my my jujitsu teacher, Sato Sensei, but he practiced Aikido. He practiced uh, uh, karate with, mm. you know, uh, Otsuka Sensei, you know, um, all the Obata when he traveled the world. Uh, yeah. uh, he traveled the world with Tomiki. You know, they they were mixed martial artists. Now, they won't they won't say that because that wasn't what you said. Right. But and they always had their root. He was a Nihon Jiu Jitsu teacher. But I've found myself, and when I teach classes, we have separate classes in karate, we have separate in kabuto, we have separate in jujitsu, and we have separate in the item. They're separate classes. Mm-hmm. If students want to take them, they can. If they don't, then they they don't. Sure. And and I love teaching those four arts out of what I've done. Uh, but I look at myself and say, well. You know, I'm I'm getting close to, you know, I'm never going to reach the top, but I'm down here where they're all, there's some, well, we're the same body and the same mindset. Um, there's that similarity no matter what. Mm. You just, I've been lucky enough from childhood to be able to switch from the style dances and same. You go to a dance contest, you don't do just the, the rumba or, you know, what you, you have to know, you know, five, 10 different styles of mm. dancing to be a dance champion. Right. And I, I, you know, so it's sort of the same, I feel, in, in, in old Buddha. I do not want to put down those that have only trained one art. I still think you're getting an influence of many arts, but, but there's, you know, I, I don't, I, for sure, sure, I don't put anybody down. Um, and like I said, I don't debate it. I know a lot of people are, oh, if you only, you must only train this, you know, um, I've even heard it come out of Japanese martial art mouths. And then you look at their background, you go, wait, <laughs> this there, there's a time and a place. And I think it depends on your goals, but for, for a lot of people, you know, you look at what their goals are and if you draw parallels into anything else, whether it's from dance to the food on your plate, having a little bit of diversity creates a perspective that you might not have otherwise. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's job versus hobby. You know, maybe, maybe you're a Shotokan practitioner who loves Tai Chi and maybe it's 90, 95, 99% Shotokan. But that Tai Chi gives your palate a little bit of a break and you can step back in with clear eyes and go, Oh, yeah, exactly. Well, I, and I think you're exactly right. You know, I in studying Iaido, my teach my Iaido teachers were Kendo mm. and and Kenjutsu practitioners. You know, and they always said, you know, you you can't just study Kendo and be a swordsman. You have to know Iaido, as the All Japan Kendo Federation says, and you can't. You know, so it's. Mm. I think it's part of the culture of of Asian martial arts, whether we go to China, Korea, it doesn't matter. It's just part of the culture. But people always want to have a grounding. You know, um, Okinawan karate, as we know, is is a mixture in itself. You know, I mean, uh, now they like to divide their karate and kabuto. Um, and I and there's a you know, there's a good there's a reason for that as you just mentioned, to have a little pilot. But, um, you know, I'd say what in Okinawa, I'd say it's got to be at least 95%, maybe higher, that all karate dojos over there practice, you know, full-time kabuto. Um, you know, so um, it's been an enjoyable, you know, it. I, I've enjoyed doing all of them. I'm a, I am a little ADE. I'm probably a lot ADD, and that has always helped me. Uh, but it's all. But the Budo has helped me control that. You know, I don't jump from one to other. I can actually split in my brain and my body the different the different arts. And I think we all have that capability. I, like I said, I I think um, I've never. I trying to think. I've never met 
a Asian teacher who is not a, a multiple martial art trainer. Mm. Um, now, they maybe only said they're teaching so-and-so, but e- even whatever they were teaching had that influence already. Right, right. even that ahead. philosophical yeah. input into their brain, you know, that this... I think if you if you're willing to look closely, I, I don't think there's such thing as purity in the martial arts. I mean, you, you talked about it, all Okinawan arts are, are smushed together at some point. Everything we train, at some point, somebody said, I'm going to take this thing and this thing that I got from that person and that person and make one thing. That there's there is no purity. And I, I think when, when people argue that or, or this obsessive focus, and again, it, to me, it comes back to why, you know, if you want to advance to your next rank in what you're training, and that is your priority at that time, or learning that new form or whatever, sure, diluting your time with other things, you know, doesn't serve you towards your goal. But for most of us, when we get to some manner of advanced rank, advanced time, and you're talking about it as a lifestyle. Yeah, I don't want to do the same thing and only that thing forever. I don't want to have the same meal, three meals a day for the rest of my life. Yep, exactly. I, I you know, and, and, you know, I think we're, I, I don't mind seeing the uh, younger generation uh want to be more pure i see no problem in that it actually you know it's like a good chef who says oh i'm gonna only you know now we already know that you know there's already a little salt and pepper and spice in there but i don't mind seeing that because i think it's healthy to have that circle continue you know that it doesn't just lead into a you know bizarre you know whatever it might be um uh situation so um and a lot of it's you know i it, looking at my own life um but it was all luck okay, coincidence and luck you know mm. i went from point a to point b you know um y- you know and then there was c and c you know i so uh, i had um I had been in 1982, uh, I went to Japan. I had been there before then, but I went to Japan with Osumu Ozawa from Las, he was a, a big Shotokan person in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. He used to run one of the biggest traditional martial art tournaments there. And they still have that tournament every year out there. And I went with him and a small group uh and i one of the things when we were in tokyo um i uh we went to the kokusai buduan uh budo demonstration that they a big demonstration that they would hold in tokyo every year with all their martial art giants that would come in and i i i was I don't even remember, my, but I was at any, I was uh, probably around at that time, you know, Yandan level. You know, I can't, I could, I, I could pick up this big old thing full of certificates that I, that I have, but I, it, it was somewhere in that price. So I'd been, mm-hmm. you know, I'd been around for a while, but I was still a young man in my thirties, you know, young thirties. Um, I think it was, you know, whatever right in that time, uh, that place. But again, it was pure luck meeting these people who, and one of the things that I've always put out is that when there was an opportunity, if somebody gave me an opportunity, I very seldom ever said no. And when I was there, you know, goes to Shiota said, well, come and train at the dojo. I'd had some my Keto background from Nakazono in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And sure enough, the next morning I was there. Then, you know, uh, meeting uh, Otsuka Jr., you know, asked me to come here. Kanizawa, oh, come to my dojo. It was underneath a liquor store. Tiny little <laughs> dojo is headquarters. In the, you know, I just, I did it, you know. Um, and that's where I met Shizuya Sato, became like a, uh, 
well, great men are almost a father sure. figure to me. But, I, you know, it was it was a lot of luck. Now, I took the opportunity. Yeah, that was that was mine. I said, I'll go. Now, that uh, philosophy, and, I assume, extended beyond martial arts. That that was a life yeah. loss. So where did that come yeah. from? Was that something that your parents instilled in you? I, gr- I grew up, yes. I grew up on a ranch family, but I grew up on one of those ranch families that, yeah, we did, you know, horses and cows and race horses and uranium and and it was that, but we lived a common life. And, you know, I I saw the stars and the governors and the vice presidents and they were just i grew up as they were just people and i was given my family didn't give money to the kids they gave opportunities come and work over here come and work here i'll give you a job here you'll get that, paid. Was, that was instilled that was that and i you got to make your own luck that, that's it you know you, I'll give you an opportunity, you choose it, and then you'll go where you go with it. And, you know, I got into oriental medicine because when I was a kid, everybody around me, all these Japanese and later Chinese, were, were practitioners. Practitioner. They didn't talk about in those days, but they all, you know, they all did that stuff. And I, you know, when I was, I had started off into med school and guy from Korea, Dr. Park, who was one of my teachers said, you know what? <laughs> There's a better route for you. You know, I think, you know, Oreo medicine was coming big, especially in New Mexico, you know, and California, but, you know, and, and I took that I route, you know, mm. it, it, it was an offer and I took an opportunity. Um, so I think, yeah, it was instilled from childhood and I just continued doing it. Um, and I still to today, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't turn down opportunities very often. Uh, I noticed that, you know, my body is getting a little harder to, to keep up the hard pace, but I still, you know, I still enjoy it. And, uh, uh, and I think, you know, I've always told my students, you know, when I, there was a, there were certain schools as I grew up that you weren't allowed to go train other places. You know, that old Mm. thing, you know, I don't know how much is out there. I don't, you know, any more like that. Um, Cause I, I sort of, you know, I I have a circle now that, you know, is not into that kind of thing. So I don't deal with the other, but in those days, you know, there was a little bit of, I don't know what it was, you know, maybe a power little thing. And I think it was was fear. It sounds like it was fear. You know, we all, I guess if we're honest, usually that came from mouths that didn't have a lot of knowledge and they didn't want, you know, my thing was, you don't have a lot of knowledge. Let's go get it. <laughs> let's go. You know, it didn't make you a bad person because your teacher didn't give you what, let's go get it. It's there. And my teachers were always supportive of that. You know, I remember he going to sensei who I've known for a long time. And when I got into Goju, which was, so after Kuniba died and such guy, and I was doing some Kaju Kimbo and stuff, I, you know, I really liked Japanese martial arts. I'd been exposed to Japan since I was a teen. So I was looking, you know, Shitoru was not difficult, but uh, they have a lot of kata. And I, I do have a, my memory. I have a, you know, one of those people who I have to really, you know, you know, cram to pass a test. I have, <laughs> and so the cut, I was realizing, man, I'm doing, you know, all these contests, but I really enjoy the goju end of it. But I also, after training with Otsuka Sensei in Japan, I thought, oh, the jujitsu of Wataru, which he, he, Otsuka second was very much into that part of his style, which Suzuki Sensei, who was also a student of his father's, was not as into that mm-hmm. part of the style. So that's where that split came. But I thought, oh, Wataru. Then I talked to him and there wasn't much Wataru over here. It was mainly in the center of the country, Tennessee, you know, um, you know, though, I mean, that 
middle part of the country. And I realized, you know, I'm not going to get the support I really want am looking mm-hmm. for. But Goju, one, I met up with Kuniaki Kai on that first in 1982. And he's one of the people also said, hey, he was a, a, a Goju Ryu Karate person. Uh, he had studied with Miyazato. He was, you know, and, and when Miyagi was still alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, he and Higona had attended the classes together. They're their same age, exactly mm. the same age. And I think they both started around 14 or 16 with with um, with Goju because they had studied, you know, as most others, other karate with local, you know, sure. family being and stuff. So he said, and he was doing, he was a great Aikidoist under Shioda. So uh, Shioda actually, I meant them within a day of each other. Uh, so Kai sensei said, Oh, much more goju, you know, you can train with. And he'd never said, Oh, just come under me. Um, I sort of just did that on my own, uh, mm-hmm. at that time. And, um, and then later I went under a man, Tanda Nori no Betsu was a fantastic, um, goju root person in, in Japan. So, I had known Higona for a long time, but his, you, it to join to, so I had invited him to seminars to teach, which he came to, but he wouldn't, he, the only people were his, okay, his top students. He'd never allow any of his other students to come. Hmm. Uh, and I, he said, oh, you know, I've got this associated in it, but, uh, but if you came into his group at that time, at that time, you did not train anywhere else. And I knew uh, Chinen at that time. He was a he and he going to were friend. They had come, you know, Chinen had gone to Tokyo with he going to. So um, uh, uh, he was up in the Seattle area. And they actually, there's a great picture of Miyazato. Uh, um, Chinen and and uh, and, uh, and um, um, I blanked. <laughs> and uh, um, it's okay. You're throwing a lot of names out. That I'm oh, not going to be I'm able sorry. to help you. That's but okay. Were, that's all right. There were the, the, the three of them um, uh, uh, all together, which was a great picture because they had sort of all towards the end they had all split you know mm. and that happened you know that's that's it happens all the arts, time martial arts and uh, but now uh you know it's it's funny how um uh th- these teachers and their organizations are absolutely open to anybody <laughs> you know, like just anybody um which I think is a really healthy thing. And you know what? Once they did that, they found that they had so many more people wanting to learn from them that, you know, it made a lot of sense. Um, So I've always pushed my students. If there was a seminar out there or they were moving somewhere, find, find somebody you like, find it, you know, don't, don't keep yourself in a box, you know, mm. uh, Budo's not a box. It's a, it's a big thing and take advantage of things. Um, and, uh, and I take my students, you know, whenever I can have an opportunity, uh, to get them to see somebody else, I, I you know, I push them to do that. And the two organizations, uh, Kokusai Budo and, and the old Japan Budo Association are Budo, both of them are Budo associations. Mm. So that's what they support. You know, they martial arts. Uh, and I've, I've had those influences for, you know, 45, 50 years. Mm. And uh, of that constant inner training. So I, d- I don't know if I got off, <laughs> got off line there, but. You did, um, but that, that's the best stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's why we have the format of the show that we do. It's just, yeah. let's, let's go. Let's see where we oh. end up. But I think, like I said, it really was luck and, and opportunity. Mm. And and uh, and now what I try to do is through that luck and opportunity is guide others uh, that may not 
may be a little more apprehensive to take opportunities. Mm. And even when the luck is there or, or the, or it, the offers in front of them. So I, uh, you know, I really, that's a big thing I really push, uh, for kids and, and adults. Um, uh, so, um, I had mentioned before I've got, I, I have a, a dojo here in Vermont. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, um, uh, I had put it, I had, I don't, I've never had a commercial school. Now I wish I could say that I had, I've had dojos like most traditional dojos where you struggle. Now I, at times in, in here and in Florida and stuff, I, yeah, I, I made, I made some money, you know, um, only out of pure luck. But uh, or taking the opportunities that were presented. Taking, well, yeah, but I think the, the money part was more a lot. Okay. Um, you know, uh, because I always, the first thing I say when someone joins and it, is that here's what we have to offer. I, if you're in class, listen to what I have to offer, but see the door over there. There's no lock on it. Mm-hmm. It opens right up. Mm-hmm. You, anytime you're on, you know, you don't feel this is for you. There it is. Mm-hmm. That's your door to the rest of the world. Um, and I think uh, I'm not putting down those who have made, had, you know, contracts, all, although you don't see many contracts anymore. Um, you know, people got a little angry at those kind of things, mm-hmm. uh, you know, stuck, you know, oh, my kid's going to take it. And, you know, and, oh, I'll sign you up for that six months or year program. And knowing that that child, the chance that they make it three months, it's pure luck. <laughs> that is luck. But yet they're getting that money for, you know, mm-hmm. the, the rest of the year. So I, I've got, you know, I got, I, I never was really into that, never had that kind of a system. Um, and like I said, I just was lucky and had good the students at certain times and other times, right uh, about, oh my gosh, 15 years ago, my last, er, com, you know, uh, what do I say? Uh, advertising dojo. I stopped and I joined my local rec program. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I have, I have a dojo, but the rec program advertises my, my program. It's a regular, you know, 24 seven, dojo but it's run through the rec program and um i don't you know i don't have to put out uh you know a lot of expense i i donate some back to that program that rec program which actually i'm a commissioner of our 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 city's um uh uh rec uh, uh commission but um i uh sounds like it allows I, you to focus on the part that it, you it, want to it does yeah, yeah. now in india I have. Okay. Uh, so yeah. you yeah, talked about it. So we, we got to go back. How, how does that happen? How, how do you oh, have gosh. a martial arts program in India? Okay. So <laughs> I was teaching for Koksai Buddha in a seminar in Issaca, Italy, one of their European uh, Congress. Mm-hmm. And a young man, uh, and this was, 35 years ago, 36 years ago, young man came, had a small group of Indians. How he got him there, I'm not sure at the time, but he's an innovative, innovative person. This guy, Sanji Gokul, unbelievable. Now he's he runs a commercial program. Uh, as does Caesar. He's uh, he's part of Northern Karate. I don't know if you know that Caesar Brokowski in mm-hmm. in Canada has the largest martial art commercial program I think in the world now. Um, I don't know that name. Oh, wow. Oh, you got him. Caesar Brokowski's. Yeah, you know, uh, he's famous all over the traditional. But he runs a commercial school, and it's highly successful. Cool. <laughs> I mean, cool. Sounds highly, like somebody we should talk to. Um, yeah, he's a fantastic uh, person, but they run a traditional mm. commercial program. And I think in Canada and the Toronto area and a few other, I mean, he's got 20 schools, you know, I mean, that are packed. Uh, coronavirus has been hard, but they just sure. had their first big congress. I think 300 people showed up 
uh, for their open uh, testing session. You know, so it, it's a it's a good size program. So Sanjay Gokul, this young man, said, "Oh, I want to bring you to India," and I said, "Okay." <laughs> I'll get in touch with you. I went home from Italy. A week later, uh, I write him and said, well, when do you want want me to come to India? And he was on, oh, you know, I set it up right then. That was open, uh, over 30, around 35 years ago. And I headed off to India. And uh, uh, from there, I, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been in India ever since, uh, off and on. Uh, I've opened special education schools over there, uh, as well as, uh, mm -hmm. I, so he was from uh, northern India, India, the Punjab area, which I lived for a long time in the Delhi area. Uh, I was there for quite a while, but then mm -hmm. I moved to the high, central India about uh, six or seven years ago. Uh, and open a program down there with him. And then I, from there, I just opened uh, in the last two years, a, I just run a, a dojo, just a regular dojo over there. So, so what, is, what does that look like? Because obviously you're here and India is so not here. I go so over, yeah, uh, coronavirus was pretty hard on us. Um, yeah. So I was doing Zoom classes. Now, mm -hmm. luckily I had, you know, Shodan's need on their TT. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, Zoom was a lifesaver for a yeah. lot of people, and it was for us. Tomorrow morning, even here, uh, I get up once a week in the morning, and I teach, uh, I teach sort of a general class, uh, in different martial art every mm -hmm. week. Uh, and they have a schedule of the different mm -hmm. classes and stuff. And uh, tomorrow is uh, karate, uh, kata and bunkai. So I'll I'll teach that. My daughter, uh, older daughter, will come over. Uh, we teach the class in the morning, mm -hmm. and then off to work. Uh, and then they run the dojo. I mean, you know, they run the dojo over there. Uh, well, run it. I we I run it from here, but they manage the dojo okay. there. So I've been doing that solid for six years, and cool. um, and luckily. I had senior instructors uh, that I'd known, in, you know, from the past mm. that came down to get the, that program going. So I always had senior instructors there, um, uh, up to Sandons. But India doesn't promote; they're just starting. Um, they don't promote real quickly over there. Uh, there's a there was a great fear that. And it and it's a true fear. If you promote it to show Don, the person was gone the next day and opened their own school. <laughs> mm. uh, schools there in India, oh, their karate and martial art programs. Uh, Hyderabad is a town of uh, three or four million, five million, maybe a smaller city. <laughs> um, and um, there must be oh thousand martial art programs i would say street programs dojo programs whatever the street the programs thousand. are they training on the street you're training outside yeah in, outside M the majority are outside oh interesting uh, a lot uh, quite a bit in schools we we also go to schools and teach uh -huh. um so we'll teach uh and um we'll go oh, most schools in india are privatized uh okay. government schools are for unfortunately for um people don't have money um but we do work in government schools we just do it for you know we just send instructors over for free we don't charge them anything and so we do have school programs that we run um and again it's all about it's not commercial i mean it's non-commercial it's more about teaching a different lifestyle um and uh that's how I started in India. So I go, personally, I go over, I just got back a month ago. It's been one month and I'll head back over there in July to take a team over to Okinawa uh, for August 1st. And then I'll come back. Then I'll go back over in October. Um, 
So I come here, do my teaching. And of course, here I've got a lot of seniors. So I, I, I can easily that have been with me 20, 30, 40 years. So I can do that. But I'm in the dojo every day. I mean, I train. I'm still one of those people train every every day um, because it's I mean, it's fun. You know, it's a great, you know, everybody says, you know, I mean, I push I push myself. I learn new kata. I, you know, do whatever it is. But um, yeah, it's I mean, it's is there anything it's beyond the fun? That well, keeps fun, you what going? I meant is it's fun to grow. Uh, excuse me for, and I'll explain what that, when I say word fun, fun can be, you know, people do MMA have fun. I may not agree with their fun, but. It's not your type uh, of fun. It's not my type of fun, but they have fun or they wouldn't be doing it. Now, they, they certainly don't do it for the money, the majority of them, that's for sure, you know. Hopefully. Uh, yeah. So. Um, So living this lifestyle, whether I'm here, I'm going out in a bit, I'm the public health officer for my uh, city, for the state, I'm state public health officer for my city. I have a private clinic, Um, you know, I'm on commissions and I'll go out and do all the, but I'm taking my Budo fun, my, what I'm experiencing, uh, you know, in into the rest of my life on a daily basis um you know and i a, a pressure situation comes up and the first you know and i'll i'll just i'm a human i'll i'll begin to react and and then the martial art kicks in back off look see watch do you know yeah. and and it just that's a nice thing that is you know you train since you're a child it, it kicks in and does that but you feel good inside I mean, none of us know whether we're going to be here tomorrow. None of us. And we hope so. And our brains plan for it. We know that now. Our brains actually plan to be here tomorrow. But we don't know that for reality. So, you you know, it's a little of that Buddha mind. You mm-hmm. got to you gotta be there. And that's what I mean by fun. I Fun doesn't mean it's hard. Fun doesn't mean that I even say, oh, God, this is just so painful right now. But the fun is knowing I got through that. You know, the, 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 it's, I have to be able to do this. I'm not doing this to discipline myself. I'm doing this that the discipline comes from doing. And if I didn't get pleasure from it, that discipline would soon fade and it would not react the same way. Um, and that's the difference between being a soldier at a time, an officer of the law at the moment. That's a job. And that's a, you, you're, you know, there are boundaries and there are requirements. And there are, in Budo, there are none of those things. There, there are none. Now, we don't, you know, I should say th- there are moral boundaries that we live by in society, of course. And we try to stay within those. Uh, not everybody does, unfortunately, but we try. But those, those boundaries aren't there. And, and, you know, it goes right back to the thread that I'm saying. I'm a budoka, you know. There were no boundaries that were ever put on me by any of my teachers anywhere in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, that's where I get that, that fun, that enjoyment. Um, you know, I, I don't, w- one of the things that I'd mentioned when, you know, I was, uh, interviewed be- to, to do this was, you know, there's a lot of, uh, trollers in martial arts now, I guess, in everything. And I'm on Facebook, you know, I, I, but I stay pretty much to my, martial arts and lifestyle i do not bring in my personal life it's it's a platform that i use uh and i enjoy it i get to say hello to people around the world that i've met and have relationships with you know that it's fantastic you know to see something from patrick mccarthy 
on there and there. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Look at that's great. I love that. You know, I think that is just fantastic. Um, but I've seen how, you know, we all know that, uh, there's bullying. I mean, that's that keyword that we use for kids, but there, there's a lot of that. There, there always has been. That's oh, yeah. nothing new to life. It's just, this is a new platform and it's an easy platform. You don't have to be in front of anybody. You can do it behind a corner. I remember when that bullshit, 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 yeah, came out yeah. and I was like, you you're making, you're, you don't even know these people and you're just judging them from, you know, get to know them, ask them, write them, write them and ask them a question. Don't discuss their, their whole issue on your little thing, write to them. You know, I remember I'm only on there once and somebody said, oh, there's a guy, Brett Mayfield, he's up in Vermont. Don't know anything about him. So I can't tell you if he's any good, but I've heard you know, that he knows all this Japanese martial arts. That was, and I'm thinking, what, where did, you know, uh, what a comment. The guy had asked, where's good training in, in, in Vermont, you know? And, and somebody put that on there. And I thought to myself, you know, well, my name's on there. And they didn't, of course, you know, rip me apart. But, um, uh, but I thought, you, you, why didn't, you know, if you were going to write that, write me. Write me, say, hey, who are you? What do you do? You know, then then you can put whatever you want on there and say, oh, this guy does this and this. I don't really well, believe if they, that. If they find out what you do, it it may suggest that you know things that they don't or you right. have rank that they don't. And a lot of people's <laughs> egos somehow, sadly, are too fragile to handle that. And, and I think that that's become, ego has become a recurring theme on this show and almost everything that we do, has because it? I think it is the, the great black hole within our community. Well, you know, ego is one of those things is, you know, the, the, you know, the, the Zen cone says, you know, and if you modernize it, ego should be there enough that when you walk out in the street, you look both directions. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yes. You know, you got to have some ego. <laughs> That's right. Um, but, uh, you know, I think I, there's that luck. I, when I've sat down one-on-one -on -one with one-on-one, -on -one, now a lot of people, I won't sit down one-on-one. -on -one. I, I have to put that out. I make that judgment. Mm -hmm. But the people I do sit down one-on-one, -on -one, I find that they're really pretty good human beings. And uh, I may not agree with their philosophy, or what they're, but they're, they're good people. They're nice people for the most part. And in martial arts, um, you know, I remember going. So Robert Trey has had a, his inner group. Uh, fantastic people. Some people, you know, I've been friends with for <laughs> 50 plus years. Um, and, you know, but Robert Trance liked to play a lot of jokes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he took it serious. He did take it very serious, but he also thought people are too serious about this at times. And I remember <clears throat> I he brought in a couple of uh, Chinese so-called teachers to one of the seminars. And everybody was impressed and getting their pictures and doing the thing. And I, the, I used to go over because my parents had a, a second or third home or whatever in, in Phoenix. And I'd go over to see him. And then I, I'd call up Sensei Treas and we'd go to lunch. I'd take him to lunch. And we just... And he said, oh, you know, those guys, you know, those guys I brought to that seminar <laughs> said, I went down, they were, they were in the restaurant. They had, they were two friends of mine who had the restaurant. <laughs> I said, you come to the seminar, we're going to make you <laughs> Chinese martial arts. <laughs> he loved doing things like that. Now he took martial arts very serious, mm -hmm. uh, but he also realized that, and he liked, he liked being who he was. Why not? If people have that big thing but he you know i wasn't part of his inner group 
by any means, but he always tra- treated me very nice. And my mm-hmm. my instructor, J. Michael Moore at that time, and that I had left. I mean, this was when I was more on my own when I'd go over, but um, he was always just a common person. He liked to tell stories and, oh man, talking too bad, he's not alive. Boy, could he tell stories about I've the old that. days. Oh my gosh, I don't even want to go into it, but he knew... <laughs> Because he knew the back the back end of these things, yeah. and he knew those people with those huge egos, and you know, uh, I'm not judging. I you know whether or not he trained with so and so or so and so. But let me tell you, when he came back here, he had some training enough that led him back to Japan many times in Okinawa, and he got to see and train and work out and observe you know, the fathers of, you know, I mean, literally the fathers or, or, or sons of the birth of, of karate. And, um, and, and he got, had a lot of information. So, you know, he was, he was one of those special things that happened and, you know, that drop in the water and he, he look what he created, you know, uh, it, he really did do a great thing. So I, I, I've, I think that's where that's that. I I see the, you know, I'll, I'll being on Facebook, I'll see these people and I'll just take a deep breath and I want to comment and say, just relax, just ask them or, you know, what's it hurting? You know, if someone's not doing a bad thing, you know, I think, it, you know, Okinawan weapons should be Okinawan weapons. They should be Okinawan weapons. But I don't give Okinawan full-bladed weapons, you know, or even heavy bows to my kids. I let them use the, you know, the light toothpick, not not toothpick, but the lighter bows. I know what you mean. You know. Yeah. Uh, now, I expect my adults to train with the weapon so that they can get a, a, a more enhanced experience. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to put down, there's some... Uh, I, Cotton is his last name. Very nice young man on Facebook. Don't know him. He's a big champion in the open uh, karate world. And I'm I'm amazed by these guys who can twirl those things around and do five backflips. And I'm thinking, that's amazing. Now, I'm not going to judge whether it's karate or not at the time. That's that's they're doing it. Who cares? You know what they want to call it. but it is amazing what they've learned and what they're doing. And I and I get pleasure watching it. I think most people do. But they'll say, oh, you know, and I'm like, come on. You know, it, it, you know, if we have. Like you said, if if there's an ice cream shop, they don't have one flavor they've got because everybody's taste is different. And, you know? and when I see someone who is presenting in that way they're competing in that way are you telling me that having that ability of control with their weapon and their ability to move their body in that way does not suggest a competency that would be relevant in a combat situation just because they're not sitting there and they're not you know they're 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 not doing bow switches for 30 minutes you know, and calling it a kata uh, does not mean that if you put the, a slightly heavier bow in their hand and say, all right, you step in and you spar that person, that they're not going to take them to task. Yeah. Well, you know, and the, and part of the point is it, you know, I, I heard something recently, recently. Karate was developed as a self-defense art. I agree and disagree. If you go far enough back, Absolutely, because it was a very, it was still a semi feudal period of time. Mm-hmm. It was under the Tokugawa realm, so nobody was having any giant battles anywhere, but the mindset was still there. And that was the idea train and prepare in, in case. That's mm-hmm. where modern, you know, Budo started to make their change. But, uh, you know, you're exactly right. Now, maybe that person, whether it be an adult or child, maybe they haven't studied the 
self-defense arts to a high level. But you're certainly right. It wouldn't, if they choose to do that, it wouldn't take them long to be good at it. No. And I think that's the key. You know, I, I never had, I mean, I had okay coordination, but not, I remember one person, you know, way back, um, in, I think when I was going to Phoenix in the early, you know, in the teen days and they say, Oh, you're so uncoordinated. And, and I, I probably was, you know, um, so mean, well, you know, <laughs> kids are kids, but I, I, I worked at it. You know, yeah. I just kept working at it. And I find at my age now, um, I can't, I'm certainly not going to run a race against, you know, a 20 year old or 18 year old, or I'm not going to, you know, I might run the race, but I'm not expecting to win the race by any means. But my technique is probably better now. I find it easier to do and more control than, and I always, and we always say that, you know, I look at my teachers, oh man, when they were 75, when they were 80, I couldn't believe how they were doing that when I go to, and now I do, I'm realizing practice just, and it, you know, yes, they were slowing down. They couldn't, move, but their body, because of all that training, focused in on on those energetics. On the, you know, martial art is not the big moves; it's the tiny moves anyway that really count on anything. You know, even even a, you look in MMA. You know, I watch you know those those one punch or one kick things they're just quick boom that's it boom down you know when they catch somebody they catch them and that's the way the body works you know so um yeah you're exactly right and and like you said i don't i i don't belittle those people who challenge through this trolling thing i just feel a little bit sorry that they're doing it. You know, I'm not saying they're not good. They may, they may be fantastic. They may be much better than me. I have no idea. I don't know. Um, but I think, you know, the idea, at least in the last hundred years, is, you know, is not to make this about conflict. And as a, every great general will tell you, the one thing they don't want to do is go to war. And it's the same, same thing. There's, it never leads to a, a good ending, right. you know? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I had that, you know, because I know there, are, <clears throat> uh, there are, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, there are, um, uh, podcasts and place that that almost i've seen i've watched a few and i don't i only see them when they pop up and i'm going oh i know that but then i'll watch and they're almost trying to trap the person in you know or, or start i shouldn't say that they're trying to start a controversy of some sort. sure and controversy you know, breeds numbers it's something that we, we yeah. struggle with internally yeah and we don't it's do it. not that the controversy shouldn't be there. We should all challenge each other in a mm. positive manner. Um, it's how we treat people when when we're doing it, and I think that's that's a key. And um, uh, and maybe why you you know you asked the question about you know I, about the tournament thing, mm. and as I as the the nineties and the two thousands and it tournaments became more um, a little egotistical and a little, and I'm sure there was, I mean, I mean, I remember people that were egotistical, but boy, they stood out in the old days. Boy, did they stand, you know? Um, and at the time they were pretty tough, but I, the ones that were really egotistical never had longevity. I noticed, you know, um, I mean, you get, I, 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 you know, watching Bill Wallace in the early days, he, he can be pretty um, sarcastic. He still is pretty darn sarcastic. He, he has a strong competitive drive. Yeah, but, 
but boy, once it's over, yep. he'll give you a hug and, you know. To, to listen to him talk about his fights, yeah. Yeah. you know, it, 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 the best example of that for anyone who, I, I don't know if, I don't know if you know, I, I had the opportunity to train, train with Bill and part of his organization, yep. but for, for folks listening who may not be super familiar with Bill Wallace, the best example of his personality is his exhibition fight with Joe Lewis because they were best friends when they stepped in the ring. And I don't, I don't mean that offhandedly. They were genuinely best friends and they beat the snot out of each other. And then they were best friends again. They were not best friends in between those bells. They were competitors. They were. And they were, they were using their skills. Mm -hmm. You know, um, one of the people that would make has a lot of knowledge and and is uh, Ray Barrera in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Mm. Fantastic martial art, been around a long, long time. He's fought Bill, he's fought Joe. Um, you know, uh, he was in the early kick, you know, the early kicks boxing. Uh, even I even sent him once in a they'll go over and, and be in the wrestling uh, thing in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> he went over and did it and and uh uh he became one of the uh, hero wrestlers yeah. you know well he did it. A great guy and he's he's uh he's done different martial arts he's a uh you know has his own stylistic of of shotokan but it's a mixed um mm -hmm. a mix but he's a very good i mean he can do unbelievable traditional kata uh raise um 70 going to be 78 and, uh, uh, and, you know, he, he, like you said, I mean, those guys, he, he, a good example is Bill. I saw Bill in Atlantic city in January. Oh, you were there too. And, uh, were you there? I, I, yeah, you I were was there. there. I, I thought, I, I thought I recognized you. I, I we didn't oh, know each other the then. Booth. You were, you were, you had a, didn't you have a table? No. No, no. If you were hanging out uh, at testing, I was there for testing. Um, but just you know, it's. Maybe. But we, I so um, uh, I'm also a, I'm part of the Guardian Angels. Uh, oh, okay. I, I, I run their Indian program oh, for cool. Curtis, and um, so I had mainly gone down this time. I've been before, uh, you know, and, uh, but I had gone down because Curtis um, we he didn't make it in um sure. because of a situation but anyway i went down because curtis wanted me to come down and talk about things but i uh, went down to support them and stuff and uh, but um i was uh watching bill's cl class and and it, when he was over i just we were just chit-chatting and i said oh i'm getting ready to call Ray Barrera. He, uh, Ray Barrera had just lost his wife mm. and Bill said, and they had been competitors and oh, for 60 years, yeah. long time. And he said, you know, I, I want to talk to him. There's that key right yeah. there. He said, I want to talk to him. And so I called Ray and I said, Ray, I, somebody here wants to talk to you and hand the phone. And that's, that's, that's what Budo's all about. Um, and if you look at if you look at at least the Japanese mind, that's how they make it. They can smack. I mean, they could go in in those days, but then they'd figure out. Oh wait, you know that's how the that's how the Tokugawa's came to buck is. Hey, you know, we, everybody's got to follow these rules. We're not gonna, you know, and and we're all the same people, and and you know, we did our thing, and. Uh, at the, you know, they, they still would battle each other, but that's where that bowing and that stuff, I mean, they had ceremony to keep it in the civil human mind, you know, and they lost that for a while, hmm. as we know. Um, and then after that, they've re, they regained hmm. it again and, or some people lost it, you know, uh, but that's, that's typical of humans. So, yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. There was that, there was Bill Wallace remembering an old friend who, you know, they beat each other up in the ring. And I, I remember in 
you know, I, I found an old photo of competing in, in, I, I'm not a Shotokan practice, but, but I competed in the first world Shoto tournament because I had gone, that's why I'd gone over with Ozawa back in that day. So we went to the tournament. <laughs> Here I am with all these international Shotokan. And I, I mean, I, I knew Shotokan enough and I knew the style of fighting and I mean, you know, so that, that was no big deal, but, um, I uh, I only made it through my first round. Uh, fought a European tall guy, remember? And, and uh, I just uh, I you know I'm I'm a front kick and getting in is because I'm a, sort of a littler skinny guy was always my style. You use your body, turn. Don't don't confront anybody too straight on. <laughs> You're gonna get pounded. And I I got through this guy, and then next round was a. Uh, Guy about my size, maybe a little shorter Japanese. And, uh, you know, he, he had that lightning fast straight in, you know, Shotokan mm. style. Boom. And he was just, you know, he was catching me pretty good. But I remember afterwards, just just immediately the smile after, you know, we got and hit, boom, boom. And yeah, and soon it was over and he bowed and we walk out and just the smiles on our face, both of us. one And just, you know, wow, that was great thing. You know, I that's that's the kumite that's the the tournament um or, or competing in a tournament in kata and doing your very best and then stepping out and watching the next person come and you're realizing that person's gonna win and you're and you start to feel you know you're a little nervous because you want to win but you're saying wow that's a really great kata you know <laughs> and so that's that's the neat part of it you know you 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 just you know you feel there's the fun again Mm -hmm. it makes you feel good inside and that's what all that training was about so what what i'm what i'm hearing if i can if i can sum it up yes because i think this is such a powerful sentiment it's the desire to be better than you were rather than the desire to be the best that's because it. if you want to be the best, you can accomplish that by keeping other people from getting better. Yep. If you want to continue to get better, you help the people around you get better because then they continue to elevate you. Well, you know, Bill being an undefeated, undefeated uh, kickboxing champ, that was mm-hmm. amazing. But he wasn't undefeated. He was undefeated in his championships. But if he hadn't lost... You know, and it, it would, I don't want, I mean, I'm not going to say thousand, but if he hadn't lost a lot, he had never won at those high levels all the time because that's, that's part of the education. That's, that's part of, you know, a uh, good example. And, and, you know, just as a kid, a uh, kid, you know, he's not that much older. He's, you know, Bill's about 10 years older than I am. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and uh, so I, and I was lucky because I I started martial arts a little bit younger than a lot of that generation because they didn't have the opportunity to start young and right. you know and like you said how well it was just pure luck and judo was the thing you know so just happened to be there Robert Torres didn't open a karate school he started teaching judo first at that dojo I mean mm. he knew the karate and he was probably giving it but nobody knew karate they came in for the judo first you know right. um, so. Uh, watching them, you know, I've read so many stories and, and I, again, I was never in that circle of, you know, uh, Joe and Bill and, and, and because I took a different little different path and the tournaments were a little bit, you know, once I started going to Japan and that just a little bit different path, but I certainly didn't keep up on it. Joe and Bill must've fought privately thou- over a thousand times. Who knows? I mean, I'm sure they both knocked each other down many oh, times, sure. you know, many times. And that was where they, that was the whole thing. They could get up and say, ah, that was fun. I, and, you know, you'd build walk away and he'd be thinking, ah, you know, I'm not going to let that open. And Joe's thinking, man, that's, I'm not going to, I'm going to, you know, yeah. and they're thinking that whole thing, not, oh, I lost or I could have beat you. No. How can I learn from what I just went through and what you just said? And that's, and that's what every class is about. You know, I love peer teaching. Even for beginners, I love peer teaching. 
you're going to get something from somebody who didn't hear and didn't see what was just said or demonstrated from somebody else. You know, good example, you know, in Aikido, everybody that went to a different class at a different time with Wushi, with Ushiba Sensei came out of the class with a different philosophy. <laughs> if you read it, it's because he was just being him, just putting stuff out there into the world, you know, and everybody was getting this picture and this picture. And that's why I say, don't stay in the box. When you get this picture, immediately find somebody who got another picture and learn from them too. Um, but it, it, you know, as you can see, it's, it's been a wonderful thing. And um, I do, you know, I talk about the past and, and I, Probably, yeah. You know, I do bring up names, and and you can see I bring them up because they gave me something. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter if it was one seminar, although I probably can't remember those from people. But you know, if I only trained six months with somebody, or only twice a year for you know eight years with somebody, I got something. Now, my regular teachers gave me the the discipline and the direction, but going training with these other people gave me abilities and um, different, you know, different uh, visions and opportunities. Um, and that's the other thing, you know, oh, you know, I only train with this person. I'm saying, no, you don't. You don't. You or Do you go to class? Do you ever work out with anybody? Is your teacher there 24 seven or do you have another senpai uh, come in and, and see their mind is it jumps to the ego without getting the fun you know you had so much fun what you were doing but your mind's jumping oh i study under master so and so uh, and you know the one thing you brought up is that you'll never reach this pinnacle you're never going to be perfect we're humans we I don't even know if we had 200 years on the planet, and if we'd get close, we probably would not. Um, and most of my Japanese teachers, although now they'll accept the word master, but there's no master in any of their Japanese dialect. It's the one who came before or the one who's there. It's never one oh you know somebody greater than me you know um and i think um you know i and, and i don't i am not offended if people use that title it's a word and everybody has a different idea of what that word means i always you know so i'm i don't disrespect somebody who says that I, oh no i'm not no that, Okay, that's fine. And I usually say, I think when they ask me what to call me, Brett, that's my, my name, you know. Uh, that's what you put down in your guest form. And and because yeah, listeners, yeah. we have asked that question to guests. And you wrote, I think you even put Brett, Brett or sensei. sensei. Yeah. Like you didn't even put Sensei or Brett. It was Brett or Sensei. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and Sensei is just, you know, a guide, a, you know, a, a person who came before and has got some great stories and information and hopefully some, some, uh, has learned from that that can pass it on movement and, and, and ideas to somebody else. And that's, you know, that's, that's all it is. Um, you know, do I have other titles? You know? Yeah. And I enjoy, you know, I mean, I, when someone gives me something, I never say, Oh no, I don't think your group's any good. Oh, great. I, I literally just, cause I'm sitting here. That's that's not even that's just there. Uh, I we're wish we're, I had we're looking at a file that, folder of what look to be certificates. I don't throw them away. I don't. I may not. I put the ones that give me a memory up. It's mm. from my memory. Nobody sees this room. They're, I'm they're, in. they're like photographs. Like, they have a representation of a period yeah. of time of an experience. And and you know that's why I put them up in my dojo. I think I have four certificates of basic things for my students to learn from so I can explain how things are. Um, you know, the rank thing. 
you know, the rank is important for you from the organization or person who gives it to you. I have rank that I'm not, wasn't worthy of, but I took it and I put it in this folder. I have rank that was a little ludicrous. I took it and I put it in this folder. I give, this is horrible. We have, if, if students in class, we have little uh, training, uh, uh, training games. Mm-hmm. You know, just like a professional baseball player plays a game. He trains. So we have training games and they can earn um, a treat. And they have to earn it. And they're not competing against each other. They're competing against themselves and, and what I give them the goal as. Sure. So they're only competing against them. Not, not that it may not be with somebody else. It certainly is. But I'm looking at two individual people. Yeah. And I tell the parents, I'm going to give them a treat and it's going to be candy. I know I'm a doctor and I'm going to give them a candy and they're going to pick it. But I tell them, if you take the candy, if you're not allowed to have candy, you could give that to somebody else as a gift. Or if you say, I don't believe in candy, you can put it in the garbage at your house. But accept the candy. It's a gift from someone. Doesn't mean you have to put it on your wall, put it in your body. You can take the gift. And and I that's sort of what everybody I've ever worked with, I look at is that whatever they give me, it's a gift. I've been to seminars that I did a lot of this, cringed. And then I'd step back and think, why did you do that? You mm-hmm. just learned something. Keep it. Every seminar I've been to, I've never been where to any seminar or any class that I haven't learned. Maybe I learned not to do something, but that's an important lesson. And so I think that's sort of, you know, how I keep enjoying this all the time. Um, hmm. If people want to get a hold of you, websites, you, you mentioned Facebook, other I don't social have, media. I have, you know, what I have sort of a business website. So I, I'm, I don't have, um, they can, you know, if they want to get a hold of me, I'm on Facebook, Brett Mayfield, use my name, <laughs> no other big things in there. Uh, just Brett Mayfield. Um, uh, I don't mind giving my email. It's wbmayfield at aol.com. Uh, like I said, my website is more, it, it has some martial arts, but it's also about special education and psychology. I, I'm, uh, I, I actually, um, so I, I went to China and got a PhD and in, integrate. I got into Oriental medicine and went to China years ago, got a PhD. It's a whole in other story medicine. we didn't get into. Yeah, that's, and, I also had my master's in psychology from Goddard and then got my PsyD uh, out in California. So my, I have a, whole, a true holistic health uh, center, which I'm slowly, I don't want to say retiring, uh, but <laughs> taking less patients than I sure. used to. Um, but uh, so that's why I don't have a, a dojo uh, website mm-hmm. um, is that it's, it's more a lifestyle and, and, um, in India, you know, I, we're on, I don't know, on the social media platforms for <laughs> adver- advertising. We don't send out, we don't have ads and stuff, but they can read on Facebook. You can say, I put my life in Budo is on Facebook and it, I, I hide nothing good, bad, or indifferent on it. Um, and so just Brett Mayfield on Facebook, uh, still one of those old timer Facebook people. I don't, don't do a <laughs> lot of the, uh, Instagram occasionally, but, sure. um, but that's, they that's can great. do that. It's been a pleasure. Uh, this is, this has and been a lot of fun. I, I, you know, when I, when you first popped on the screen, I was like, wait a minute, I, I know you, I, where do I, and, I, I, I can see you wearing the red beret. I've seen you before. So, um, but, um, Anyway, and we're, we're, we're too close to, you know, we're, 
45 minutes away from each other. We're, we're yeah. going to have to connect. Yeah. So I'm yeah. Glad this any, happened. anytime. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I always invite people to come down to the house. Uh, I actually live in Quichi. So oh, you're uh, even closer. Quichi. Yeah. So, um, uh, and uh, I've been in, I came out to Vermont in 80, at, after I'd gone to Japan in 83 uh, and opened my first dojo in Woodstock out here. Mm. Um, and, um, then opened up, I took over. So after I was in Woodstock, Pete Porter sh was shutting his school down. That's when mm. he shut his school down. Yeah. And I stepped in and took over the school, uh, and, um, upstairs in downtown white river junction. That was a long, That's, long time. A few ago. years ago. So, um, so we've had a dojo of some sort nonstop since mm. 1980, 83 here in Vermont. Um, but, um, yeah, even, um, uh, Ken Baldica, I think he was, Ken was, I think he was Sundon. And when Pete left, they had also had a little fall mm -hmm. But anyway, he, uh, he trained for a while, but it was dip because, you know, uh, Pete did more of a Sean Rue, um type of stuff and then he and then uh then ken found uh oh what's his name the other show and road people over in in new hampshire over there uh blanked out on the name but um i've always i haven't seen ken in a while i used to stop in check in see how he was doing but um nice guy i've always liked oh ken. yeah super ken nice guy. Spartan. yeah always and he was a big AA person when i was down in florida and and uh you know, he, he was quite, there's a good example. Nice guy, great competitor. Of course, life changed for him for when he got sick, but uh, great, good competitor. He could fight hard and then be super nice guy afterwards. So, but well, we always thank ask you me. so much. Yeah. Well, I, I want to ask one more thing of you because yes. I'm going to record an intro and an outro, but yeah. I like for, for the guests to kind of wrap it up in, in, in some way. So this is, this is your shot to kind of send us out, you know, so what, what do you want your final words to the audience to be today? Well, I think that Asian martial arts, Japanese called Budo, uh, is a, is a lifestyle, a true lifestyle, almost a psychology for the mind. Cause the Asians didn't have a psychology because they had these other instruments like Budo to do that for them somewhat. And my thesis actually for my master's in psychology was Budo as a therapy. And it's been a lifestyle therapy. It's helped me in everything I have done. And whether, like I said, a four-year-old comes into my class or an 80 year old who still is training with me at some point, they're getting something for themselves to better their day and hopefully their tomorrow. And uh, it's been a wonderful journey for me. And I and I'm not done by any means. I'm still I I'm like those old guys who say, I'm not old, I'm not old at all, you know. And I I every, you know, hopefully the next 20 years will will be as exciting as, as the past years. So, I mentioned in the intro that the word that stuck out for me in thinking about this episode was selflessness. And I still think that. We all train for our own reasons, and we all find our own slot within the martial arts world. Hopefully that slot reflects our why, the things that are important to us. I can't imagine Sensei Mayfield, if I phrased it to him this way, you know, does your, your place in the martial arts world reflect what's important to you? I, I would imagine a resounding yes. This is someone who's invested a lot of time into themselves and others, and at least in the context of this conversation, I heard it come back. So, sir, thank you for coming on the show. And I am completely certain that we will connect soon.
Listeners, remember, if you want more, you can go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We have the full show notes there. There's plenty of stuff that we post that your podcast player isn't going to give you. Photos and videos and links and social media, transcripts, all that good stuff. And if you're down to support us in all of our work, you have options. Maybe buying one of our books on Amazon, telling others about the show, or supporting our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. If you'd like to have me come to your school, teach a seminar, we can do that. We still have some slots open for this year. And of course, if you're listening to this into the future, I'm sure we have slots open somewhere. If you reach out, we'll find a way to make it happen. Remember the code podcast15 to save 15% on anything at whistlekick.com. And if you've got any feedback you'd like to share, anything from guest suggestions to topics to uh, recently somebody noticed a small change that we'd made in the way we handle episodes, and that that meant a lot to me, a positive change. Uh, You can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media, pretty obvious. It's at whistlekick everywhere you can think of. And that brings us to the end. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.